on social media, any, you know, Reddit's Reddit, Reddit or Twitter or Facebook, whatever. When somebody asks a financial question, here's an example. Somebody who says something like, should I contribute to my traditional 401k or my Roth 401k? The person you should trust is not the person who tells you what you should do. The person you should trust is the person who their first comment asks a follow-up question. It's the person who cares more about what's right for you than what's right for them. Anytime somebody gives you an answer straight away, they're saying what they would do, which by the way is usually what you should, you know, not what you should do. So I think it comes down to you, you end up trusting sources. You know, we've both seen this examples of this where, yeah, where effectively you only want to take advice from somebody who's curious enough to know which advice to give you. And just like, you know, people don't post enough information on those forums to actually get personalized advice. Um, if somebody, by the way, um, there's also a big difference between advice and education. Advice is telling people what to do. And education is helping people gain, gain the clarity and confidence to make their own well-informed decisions. So I'd say if you are on social media and looking at different things and Reddit forums, only take advice, quote unquote advice from people who actually care about you and your family, not just your finances. Welcome to the Child Free Wealth Podcast, hosted by Bree and Dr. J, Certified Financial Planner. Here we discuss life and finances as it relates to being child free. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please consult your advisor before implementing any ideas heard on this podcast. Hey, Child Free Wealth listeners. Today, I actually brought in one of my friends, Cody Gary. He's a uh, certified financial planner, just as I am, but he's kind of like in a little bit of a weird world of this. His whole world is around generosity, giving back, and he's done a lot of work with DIYers and saying, okay, how do you do this? If you're in the fire community, you've seen him post somewhere. Like, I mean, I swear the dude lives on social media, you know, like, yeah, I happen to be on Facebook with him and like, your friend just posted 700 things. I was like, oh yeah, that's Cody. But it's one of those things where we were having this discussion over time saying, you know, does everybody need a financial planner? Can you do it yourself? Where are the pitfalls? All that. So we're going to dig into that. I will freely warn you, both of us, Cody and I, like we can go on talking to each other for hours. We've done it. I apologize if we ramble, but Cody, great to have you on the podcast. I oh, appreciate you inviting me. I'm always glad to talk. Any audience, uh, just helping people uh, with my trademark, keep finance personal, really going beyond the numbers as we'll probably do today. But yeah, I, I really appreciate you letting me kind of create impact beyond one-on-one -on -one financial planning by serving people I don't even know yet. Yeah. And I use the word generosity because that's one Cody uses all the time. It's really about giving back and that's perfect for this. So Cody, I'm going to ask you the first question and I'm setting you up for this and go for it. There's kind of like, if you go online, there's two worlds. There's either like nobody needs a financial planner or everybody <laughs> needs a financial planner. Where do you land? I land in this place that everybody has a financial plan but it's up to you whether or not it's going to be intentional or not and align with your life, not somebody else's life. So to back up a little bit there, I don't believe that everybody needs to hire a financial advisor. I guess we can also break down like, what would you actually use them for? Because most, by the way, let me step back even further, which is most people who say, you know, nobody needs a financial advisor. You can just do this yourself. And you just read this one book. They're limiting the scope of what they think an advisor does. Most people think a financial advisor or even a financial planner, their job is to choose investments, buy and sell securities. And they go, well, I can do that on my phone, so I don't need an advisor. But for example, in my financial planning business, I cover typically 25 to 30 topic areas in financial planning. And just one of them is choosing investments. So let's maybe start. I think that everybody needs to gain clarity and confidence with how their money is working. And I call it everything in your life with a number on it. You need to have clarity on where it is, how it's working, and most importantly, that your money is aligned with your life, not somebody else's life. Yeah, and I think this is why Cody and I uh, go on for hours together, because I say it as you plan for your life first and your finances. We're saying the same thing. We're just right, you right. know using different uh, terms we like to use. And I think you're right. And if we build on that investment one, the way I say it is, your investment can be really simple. Simple, passive, long-term investment. You can pick up the simple path of wealth, read it. That's easy. The tax planning around it, and is it going to your goals and what's your insurance and like the life and are you get, that's the difference. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. There, you know, there's a lot of different like quotes that you, you hear me say around these things, but um, one of them is I encourage people, it's actually kind of like a stoic thing, right? 
if you were to put everything in terms of your finances on a piece of paper into two columns, the things I can control and the things that are out of my control, I teach both clients and through my educational content to non-advisors that we really want to become more passive with our investments and the part of our investments that's out of our control so that we can become more active with our life and the things that are within our control. So I think first understanding and creating a framework for what's in my control and what's out of my control is necessary in alignment with what I call your comprehensive financial ecosystem. There's a phrase I use. You first have to understand where you are before determining where to go and how to get there. Before you can figure out what to do, you have to understand where you are, but also which elements of your finances are within and in your control. I'm with you. I'm going to push you back. You did not answer my question. My question what? is, does everybody need a financial planner? Or, you know, you said, hey, everybody has to have a financial plan, but like, where's the line? So one of the things I've worked on is helping mm -hmm. people understand there's a lot of stuff you can do by yourself. And there's kind of a lot of things that you can get done and do well by yourself. But then there is a place for other help and you need to find that balance. And the way I say it is you need to figure out how to learn. If you want to learn on your own and you can do that, it, cool. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn from somebody else, cool. Like it doesn't matter because mm -hmm. both of us just for clarity, we're both advice only. So we don't do investment management. We don't make our money off a percentage-based AUM, you know, something like that. So we've got a different picture. Where's the line for you? When should they call Cody and say, hey, I need help? Well, I may, may push back a little fun. So Dr. J, do you have a financial planner? So I have coaches. I've got people in different areas. Do I have one that does all of my financial plan? No. So it's a slightly different. So I look for specialists, let's call it that. You know, so if you think about it as a doctor model, I don't have a primary care doc, but I have specialists. Well, that's a great transition to how I think about it as well, which I do believe we think about when we're talking about money, right? We're talking about finances. It's like its own like piece of the pie, this, this whole idea of wellness. And the way I describe it is you have your physical, mental, spiritual, relational, and financial wellness. That's like pie of wellness areas. And I believe that everybody, this is the part where I will be very binary all or not that I will say everybody needs a mentor in every one of those areas. Maybe rather than saying like everybody needs an advisor or a financial planner, I think you need somebody, you need a thought partner, a mentor, somebody standing alongside, not being the hero of the story, but the guide. Like I think you need a mentor in your physical health, mental health, your spiritual practice, if you have one. I believe everybody does in their own way. And then a mentor, maybe in terms of relationships and complex. Or like, and then lastly, your financial wellness, which includes financial planning. Not everybody needs to hire a, a registered financial professional, but I do think that you need to be mentored either by an individual or become, just like you said, become genuinely curious to learn and surround yourself with a community of other personal finance people who are kind of doing the journey together, but I call it alone together. Yeah, and by the way, you know, people think that you become a certified financial planner, you know everything. The answer is no. We just know how to Google things better, and we know who to ask. Yeah, you find out just enough to know what you don't know. It's like walking into a library. Not until you walk into a library do you realize how much you don't know. It's actually a humbling experience. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know effectively. Yeah, I think the difference is for you and I, you and I have a list of people that, you know, if I have a specific question about X, I know where to go to. Right. You know, and... and and there's somebody I can ask the question and behind the scenes, just kind of like a pull the curtain back. When clients have questions, I go to other CFPs. I'm like, so you're the expert in stock options or this or that and the other. And I'm like, what about this? And I had one the other day and working through some issues of multiple businesses and one SEP IRA and how is it? And I went to two different tax people like, you know, I got to ask some like, like we're like three <laughs> people deep looking for these answers. All right. We're out there getting help too. I think it's easy in terms of marketing for financial professionals, even though financial advisors, financial professionals often market this idea of like, I know how to do this. I know how to do this. I know how to do this. You're actually not helping yourself as an advisor by trying to learn everything. And I, the, the phrase I use is, you know, if you try to be everything to everybody, you end up being nothing to nobody. We very much stay in our lane, not just in what we know, but who we serve, understanding without a scarcity mindset, with an abundance mindset that not only can we reach out to an extended network of other professionals for guidance on specific you know, things, but we also have a network of other people who can better serve those clients that aren't the right fit for what we know and who we serve. Yeah. So a great example of this, Cody and I are both a part of a group. Annie Panko runs it, Retirement Planning Education on Facebook. And Cody will flat out tag me like, hey, this person's asking a question about child-free finances. 
go talk to Dr. J. Back and forth. This is what we do because we know those experts are there. But I think the challenge is if I'm a consumer, so now you know I'm not a CFP, and I'm like in the Reddit world because I hate Reddit a little bit some days and I love it some days. But like you know, Reddit, they just hate all financial planners in most of the groups. I mean, let's be honest with that. You know, if you're going to do it yourself, how do you know whose advice to follow versus not? And I understand it's not actually financial advice, it's education and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. like, if I'm in those groups, any person can post. Mm. Yes, you're calling out the expert on it, but they have no clue who to trust or not. You make that I actually have an, I have an easy metric for this, is that on social media, any, you know, Reddit's rather Reddit or Twitter or Facebook, whatever, when somebody asks a financial question, here's an example. Somebody says something like, should I contribute to my traditional 401k or my Roth 401k? The person you should trust is not the person who tells you what you should do. The person you should trust is the person who their first comment asks a follow-up question. It's the person who cares more about what's right for you than what's right for them. Anytime somebody gives you an answer straight away, they're saying what they would do, which by the way is usually what you should, you know, not what you should do. So I think it comes down to you, you end up trusting sources. We, you know, we've both seen this examples of this where, yeah, where effectively you only want to take advice from somebody who's curious enough to know which advice to give you. And just like, you know, people don't post enough information on those forums to actually get personalized advice. Um, if somebody, by the way, um, there's also a big difference between advice and education. Advice is telling people what to do. And education is helping people gain gain the clarity and confidence to make their own well-informed decisions. So I'd say if you are on social media and looking at different things and Reddit forums, only take advice, quote unquote, advice from people who actually care about you and your family, not just your finances. Yeah. And I think the way I do it, you, you're really good at asking the questions and I tend to not live on social media as much as you do. So I, I don't have the time to dig into it. I apologize. Social media is just not where my skill set is. What I do is I'll say, okay, here are a couple articles, a podcast, something that goes mm -hmm. into the question you're asking mm -hmm. that's going to answer it for you. Mm -hmm. But you need to look, like you need to do the work of look right. at this. Teach a man or teach a woman to fish. Right. Yeah. I send that to people and Facebook has uh, smacked me upside the head for posting links. I'm like, what the heck? Like literally, <laughs> they ask the question here. But he said, I always get the question of Leo, who's going to take care of your older long-term care, all that, how much does it cost? I have an article that has prices, that has like, like all the details and Facebook would be like, oh, you're, you're promoting a link. I'm trying like, to sell something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, it's selling nothing. Like literally like, because if I start asking, well, what age are you? And are you married? And what is this? Other? Like, we're going to spend the next six weeks doing this. Right. Right. But then you'll see people. You're right. That just on Facebook, like long-term care is great. example. like, nope, it's all a scam. You should never have it. My, my mom had long-term care insurance and it never got used. So it was a waste of money. So now like, I believe it's a waste of money for everybody because of my one circumstance. Yeah, I think my other caution on if you do it yourself and you go online is you want to follow the recipe that matches you and not mixing recipes. I see a lot of this where people take advice from a bunch of different places. It's actually good advice in multiple locations, but when you combine them, it doesn't work. They're like two good ideas, but yet they're conflicting. Well, double example of this. If, you, if you're going to follow the Dave Ramsey world of no debt, you can't follow the Grant Cardone world of all debt. Like They, they just don't <laughs> right. go together. Right. And, and also you, you make a good example of, we, we think not just in money, but like in life, we think very binary, black, white, red, blue politics, right? Like, but we also think binary about no debt or all debt. Like we need to remind ourselves that not only is there like a spectrum of implement ways to implement things and strategies, but there's also a spectrum of who's telling you what from previous experience, the person who might be telling you no debt, they might have a huge, a big family history of trying to break the chain of debt. Whereas somebody who says like all debt, they actually understand the difference between debt and leverage and some of those like more detailed, right? They're not going to spend paragraphs teaching you all, everything they've learned over the last five years about that concept. Well, yeah. And they have a recipe for a reason. So like we have the eight no baby steps and we have, it actually happens to be a no debt plan. It's meant because each of the steps go together. If you pick just to like follow step five, the other four steps are important for a reason. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, we start mixing things and then all of a sudden you're not getting what you want out of it. That's actually, that's a, it's funny. It reminds me of how I think about, you know, a lot of people binge watch shows 
right? They've watched like the whole season. I'm the type of a person who like watches the finale first because like that's always like the most like exciting, dramatic. Like Marissa will laugh because we'll watch my my wife Marissa will laugh because I'll we'll watch like a cooking competition show and I'll like I'll watch like one of the last episodes first or watch a recording of Jeopardy. And I'll watch actually like the, the final episode of the tournament. And she's like, wait, like, but we all have that like idea of like, it's that instant gratification. Of, like, let me get, it's just like a kid. Like they want to do like, everybody wants to do the advanced classes. They get really excited about like the advanced, like, oh, I want to do advanced calculus. We're like first figure out like plus and minus and things like that. We get really excited about advanced concepts because when we do advanced concepts, we feel we're affirmed, right? We feel like we're, we're smart, like, or we compare ourselves to others like, oh, if I'm in an advanced class, I'll be smarter than other people. So we th- think the same thing with money of saying, if I'm using an advanced super tax optimized strategy, I must be ahead of others where you step back and you're like, wait a minute, you're actually not in a race <laughs> with others. I guess you first have to step back and understand that this is, it's very difficult on social media not to compare because it's been designed to try to make you compare yourselves to others. Just the way that algorithms work out is they're trying to make you jealous. So you spend more time do going down those rabbit holes of uh, other people on vacation versus just giving you, you know, the education you need to step away from the phone and live your life more actively. Yeah. And by the way, this is where I usually get myself in trouble because somebody would be like, well, I want to do X, Y, Z investing. I saw this, mm. especially as they're saying the word alternative investing or, you know, like something fancy. And then I'll talk to him like, listen, you got a credit card that's got 20% interest on that. Pay that off first. That's a nice investment return. <laughs> and they're like, but I'm going to miss out on this cool thing. And I'm like, 20% tax-free, risk-free return. <laughs> Do that. Yeah. And they're like, but I'm not going to get ahead if, and like you get stuck in these circles. And that's the nuance that you miss if you're just trying to do it on your own. Well, there's a lot of productivity people and stuff that'll say something like, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend your time with. Which I think is like a, it's a net positive in that attitude of like surround yourself with like people who are like, you know, up leveled or like in the next step of life than you. But that can also be very dangerous in terms of that comparison and always feeling like you're never enough is if you surround yourself with people who are not, uh, maybe that makes the case, like surround yourself with people who are one step ahead, not five steps ahead. And the, most of the people we follow on social media, especially if you have a, like a ton of followers, they're the ones who they make it look really easy. And they're not going to tell you, they're only going to show you the tip of the iceberg, not all the stuff that went into becoming successful. A good, good example of that would be that, you know, the Grant Cardone 10X. If you're trying to 10X before you're even 1X, <laughs> right? You got to kind of reevaluate who am I surrounding myself with and how much further ahead, quote unquote, are they? You know, and yeah, and people get bored by the basics. So I want to talk about a basic one that, that Cody's got a kind of interesting thing, which is cash management and we we'll call it budgeting, we we'll call it whatever. And I saw you had this like, outline like between like what you're spending but what your goals are or what's important you kind of talk through that like matrix because it's really cool everybody thinks about budgeting as something you spend money on and then the next column is how much you spent on it but i found working with the families i serve that as soon as the numbers are on the screen they can't focus on the transaction they can only focus on how much the transaction costs i do an exercise where i actually eliminate initially i eliminate the numbers from the screen and what we do is we have a list of all the things that they spend their money on. And by the way, you don't have to like list. Like I actually, I did this with a family where we actually looked at over 2000 transactions, like literally like through that many. Whereas, you know, you can, you make them, put them into categories, sometimes 30. Sometimes you just put it into like basic, like just like house, fun, giving, right? Things like that. But when you break it out like that, let's say you came up with like 20 different categories. One of them might be somebody goes out to eat at a Mexican restaurant once a week. Maybe something that they do like a lot. You know, there's a lot of those transactions. Maybe it comes its own category, like Maria's Mexican restaurant. But what I do is I have them actually order those transactions. We've take, taken away the money. I just have them order the transactions, effectively looking at each one and saying, okay, Maria's Mexican restaurant and working with spouses, especially, I'll have each of them say, how much do you value this, not expense, but this experience, right? How much do you value Maria's Mexican restaurant going to this restaurant from a zero to a 10? And each spouse says what their number is. And what's kind of funny too, is I've had it where one spouse says a two and the other spouse says a three. And they're like, wait, I thought you liked that restaurant. Wait, I thought you liked that restaurant. So it's an opportunity to communicate. But more importantly, when you've gone through all of this, then you can actually rank all of those transactions, not in terms of dollar amount, but in terms of value, how much value they provide to you. You can either rank them or just put them like to a one to a 10 on each one. But what's cool is that now that you have them ranked by value, subjective value of how much they provide to your family, 
Then you plug in the numbers and you say, why is it that the thing that we both value as a one is actually one of the most, the things that we spend a lot of money on? And then why is the Me Maria's Mexican restaurant that's a 10, that could be an 11 if we could give it an 11, we turn this one up to 11, right? Like, why are we spending, why are we only going them get there every two weeks when we could go there every every week? I take very much like a Ramit Sethi approach. I've learned kind of like after the fact that I use this approach, which is that I really help people not cut spending on the things that they enjoy, but spend less on the things that don't provide value so you can spend even more on the things that you do as long as, by the way, the numbers work. I'm not gonna give somebody permission to spend more than they make, but at the same time, I think everybody, there's a phrase, by the way, Dr. J, here's a little exercise for you. Do you spend less than you make or do you make more than you spend? I spend less than I make. Dr. J's, a lot of people say like, what's the difference? Like that's the same. Oh no, there's, there's a huge difference, I got it. Right, right. so there, yeah, there's a big difference and there's an intention there that you're intentionally spending less than you make rather than just saying, well, I make more than I spend, so who cares? There's an intentionality. But I think that intentionality isn't just about making sure that you're you're in the black, not the red in terms of your numbers matching up, but that your intentional spending comes from also understanding that this thing I purchase or this experience that we're experiencing together as a family is something that we value enough. Because value, a lot of people think about value as a dollar amount, but there's, there's two parts of it. There's like, there's the dollar amount, right? And then like, how much you received and how much you received from a transaction is not just quantitative, it's qualitative. There's emotion involved. There's memories. A lot of people spend money on memories. They're like, we're not going on this trip. Like we're not staying in this hotel because it's an expensive hotel and we can be, maybe some people are like that. We're like, I'm staying at a nice hotel. But they're like, sometimes I have to encourage a family. Hey, you've been staying at the hotel that's five blocks from the beach, but I'm wondering like, what would that experience and that memory look like if you stayed at the place that's right on the water? where you open the sliding door and sand flows into the room. Like you're that close. And people are like, wow, like I've never thought about it. Like we've always like the, we've always stayed at the cheaper place, but we have to walk like five blocks. Our feet get burned on the concrete along the way, right? But once you start understanding, like what do you actually value about the experience? You could be more intentional about how you spend money on it. Just like you said, life first, money fits into that. Don't fit your life into your money, especially if you're working with somebody who's going to encourage you along the way. Yeah, and I, what I like is you have a systematic way of doing it. The way I explain to clients is, look, your goal is to go to Paris. Do you really want that DoorDash or do you want to go to Paris? And it becomes a question of priorities. Both can be priorities, but which one do you want more? And it's funny, when people are like doing a bit of mindless spending, when you say, do you want that mindless spending or do you want your big goal? It becomes a light bulb going, oh, that's why I don't get to buy my new car, travel, whatever your goal is, give whatever it is. And, and I'm using this as an example of like, that is the most basic money management stuff, but it sets the foundation for everything else. Mm. So let's shift a little, Cody. We're going to kind of do a little speedish round. Cool. And when I work with DIYers, he said this way, he said, he came to me because he wanted to know his unknown unknowns. And I was like, Ooh, I hear that a lot. Be, like, that's a good question. Because if I know what to Google, I can get an answer. You know, if I don't know what to Google, <laughs> I end up with the answer. Like, it's just kind of how that works. We're going to take turns. I'm going to throw one out. You throw one out. We'll go back and forth. Of like, common things we see, we're looking at people who have been doing DIY and, like, here's some traps. And I'm going to use one that, just because it's been annoying me this year, the amount of people that have done backdoor IRA contributions, backdoor Ross, that didn't do the paperwork right, whether it's the 8606, the IRS form, or had other IRAs. And I have spent more time this year unwinding things and cleaning up accounts and I've got people decades of this where I'm trying to do it. And I'm like, listen, you did all this work for $7,000 and you messed it up somewhere in between. And now we got to file with our, like, looks cool. Looks like a good idea. But it that is one that I think I seen one person this year, DIY, that did it by themselves, right? And the rest were right. all something in the middle. Does that one jump out to you? Yeah, that's a huge one. You know, that form 8606. It's also something that even if you're using a tax repair, they might not even ask you especially if they're, if they're doing 350 returns in one month, like they're not going to give you a phone call and say, Hey, I noticed you contributed to this. Like you did a Roth conversion. Like, was that, you know, was that a backdoor? Or was that taxable? Right. You know, usually when people are doing it, like they know why they're doing it, but they're not communicating it. But one that actually comes to mind, I kind of, you know, another example of that is and this is even the most sophisticated DIY investors I work with. It's a very simple check the box 
that people don't do in their investment custodians, such as Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, is they don't automatically reinvest their dividends, especially within their retirement accounts. I'll meet with a client who has, they've done such a great job, right? They, they got like the 90% right, but then they've actually built up $20,000 of the cash is sitting in their Roth IRA and has for the last few years because they didn't check one box to reinvest those dividends. And in terms of long-term investments, like that's something where, you know, we, we understand the, the awesome effect of a compound interest, but you also have to make sure that those dividends and the interest and those distributions from those mutual funds and ETFs that you buy, that those are automatically reinvested to buy more because compounding doesn't really happen if the money just all the money that you're growing isn't growing on top of that money. Absolutely. And the one that reminds me of is, you know, kind of like they also ones that put money into an IRA, but then don't invest it. You know, so have cash sitting in there, been there for a while. Let me go to my next one. I see a lot is they don't have disability insurance. Hmm. And it, disability yeah. insurance through work can be pretty cheap. But reality check is if you don't have it and you get disabled, Social Security disability sucks. Like you're getting like nothing. And but what will happen is they'll have this great investment plan, but that disability insurance is overlooked. And the result is if they get injured, they're out of luck. Very much think that comes down to this idea of it won't happen to me. And I think that people don't take, I think a lot of people hear about life insurance, right? I mean, you talk about Dave Ramsey, that's something that like, you know, he pushes, F figure out how much life insurance you need. It's like a whole nother conversation because I think there's, uh, there's a lot of kind of bad rules of thumb around that. But dad, disability insurance, there's also confusion too that I think a lot of people assume that disability is related to your job. And it's always something where like, oh, like somebody who works with like saws all day accidentally saws off his hand. Like that's a disability. There's a difference between like workers comp and disability insurance. And the statistics show that actually most people aren't disabled by like a work accident or like a physical accident, but actually by illness. So I think that's something where there just needs to be a lot more education around disability, you know, more common than premature death much, much more. I think it's what is like one third or something will experience some sort of disability. I think it's also because disability insurance is more expensive than life insurance. Well, actually, I, I'm going to argue with it there a little bit. It's because the insurance agents make more commission on selling life insurance than disability insurance. Interesting. Well, and along with that too, I think just the idea that another reason that disability insurance is more expensive than in this example, term, we're talking about like term life insurance, just paying for the death benefit purely is that in terms of disability versus life, the reason disability insurance is more expensive is because it's more like, right? So the, <laughs> you can the, actually use it. Right. So yeah, the insurance company knows that more people will be disabled than die prematurely. Therefore, you're going to pay a higher premium for disability, assuming that it's actually the right coverage for you. Great. Your next one. So my next one would be thinking about, I call them squirrels, <laughs> which is all those different accounts you have everywhere. You know, you've got checking savings at two different banks and you've got your Roth IRA, your traditional IRA, your 401k, your 403b, your 457b. You know, you've got your like pension plan that may or may not get someday, right? I think it really comes down to not necessarily consolidating, I mean like putting them all in one account, right? There can be some huge tax and liabilities if you try to put everything into one account. But I think the biggest part is we think of all these accounts separately, but I'd encourage all DIY investors that you need to think of everything in all those assets all those investment accounts, it creates a total portfolio. What I mean by that is I work with retirees who say, you know, if they're going to retire and a very common example is I'm going to have 60% of my investments in stocks, equity. I'm going to have 40% in bonds, fixed income, a 60-40 portfolio as they call it. But what happens is they invest every account, 60% equity and 40% bonds, fixed income, without understanding that you can create a total portfolio of 60-40, but your Roth IRAs could be 100% equity and your traditional IRA could actually be like 40-60, right? So just understanding that even though you have all these different accounts, they don't have to be identically invested. You can think of them as a total portfolio. The money's fungible and then you can put the right types of investment. I, I call them putting the right passengers into the right vehicles along the way. Yeah, the asset location is one of those that like, just it's missed. And by the way, sometimes you don't have as much control over your 401k. Well, so you fix it on their areas. Like, and I'm like, you're totally in net worth. That's kind of interesting. I've seen people do it like, I don't count my house. I don't count this. I don't count that. I'm like, it's all part of this picture, <laughs> you know? Well, but that doesn't really count. No, it really does. Mm. And from a tax standpoint, it does. And just moving which account has which thing can be big. I'm with you on that, Cody. Next up on my list, and now this partially because I serve child-free folks, so it's a hot button for me, 
is not having wills, power of attorneys, beneficiaries, executors, all that in place. And I don't care what age you are. Everybody's like, when I get old, I'll do that paperwork. No, you'll get in a car crash well before then and not have the paperwork and you don't have somebody on that paper, you know, especially if you're single, mm -hmm. I mean, you need that paperwork immediately. You know, single with no kids, people are like, well, but it costs a lot of money. No, you can do the simple ones. Like I recommend trust will for simple ones. By the way, not perfect, not great for people complex, but at least you have something in writing that says this is what I want. And then we can get more complex after. Yeah, you know, we can have a separate discussion on like people then get too complex and start doing fancy trusts for no reason. But like start with the basics. You need to get the paperwork done. And I'll add to that. I think there's the two idea here is that most people think a will or a trust. Again, they're thinking about money when they're thinking about these things. They think that a will is about who gets what. But what we're talking about the importance of who helps with what. Right. There's a big difference between like just bequest and who gets who gets this money when I die, who gets the, the rocking chair, who gets the house, who gets the car. But what we're talking about, it's more important is who helps with what, right? Who helps with the money? Who helps take care of the children? So just think about in that idea of like who helps with what, not just who gets what. And another part of that misconception is people think that estate planning is for rich people, right? Again, that goes back to just thinking about who gets what. But getting these things done especially like like very easy form, like is not very expensive, especially in terms of the headache, kind of going back to this, the idea of life insurance. A lot of people, uh, you shouldn't be asking the person who's going to die how much life insurance they want. You should be asking the person who's going to be surviving without that spouse, right? Or that other person. So the same thing with estate planning, the estate plan is not for the person who passes away. It's for the person who has to clean up the mess and is a few hundred dollars, 500, a thousand dollars worth not having to put not just a financial burden, right? But just that, that what I call return on hassle, like you talked about earlier hassle, you know, how much is $500 or a thousand dollars worth so that when you do pass away or something were to happen to you, that your surviving spouse or family, they can grieve emotionally, not for the administrative cost of you not being there. Yep. Got a last one, Cody, your last favorite uh, DIY or thing that gets skipped or missed or overlooked, unknown, unknown. I, I probably get blown up for this, but the idea of, especially in the DIY, like the FIRE communities, that the financial independence retire early communities, there's this idea that, you know, you just buy one fund. And I think that that's what really missed there is that it makes sense to buy very, I mean, I think you should always be simple with your investments again, but that said, like re even retirees I work with might not ho have more than like three or four different investments in their accounts, but they're still diversified. But I think it's really important to understand that usually when you're talking about like buying one stock fund or something that you're really talking about something that you, where you won't need the money in like 20 or 30 years. So the last thing I'll say here is the idea of, you've heard me say it, Dr. J, which is give every dollar a job and a use by date, right? So before you choose an investment, you have to understand what is this money going to be used for, or at least you have to make an assumption. What is this money going to be used for? And when will I need this money to pay for X? You know, what's going to be used for? If somebody comes to me and says, I'm buying a house next year, what should I do with this money for the down payment, right? If they were to go onto Facebook or Reddit, they'd, all they'd say is, oh, I have $200,000. What should I do with it? Everybody's going to say to invest it long-term because they didn't know what the money was going to be used for and when you need it again. My last misconception is don't choose the investment first. Understand what it's for, when you're going to need the money again. And when you have those two questions answered with pretty good clarity, it's so easy to determine which investment to buy. Yeah, and the way I say it is to only invest in things that you understand. And to understand the investment, you have to understand what you're investing in, where to keep it, and how it impacts your financial plan. You know, yeah. it's getting to the same word. You and, you and I, Cody, are getting to the same place just with yeah. slight like, wording. <laughs> and we'll also, on that as well, like that idea of, you know, don't invest in something you understand. Like you have to understand the investment, but you also have to understand yourself and how that investment fits within your life. For sure. Absolutely. I always argue if somebody, if your investments are keeping up at night, there's a problem. And the problem is either you don't understand the investments or you took on too much risk for yourself. One or the other, and maybe a bit of both, but I think that's the hard part is you got to stop and learn it before you just jump and go, Hey, I'm going to pick this one fun and chill. Cody, where can they find you? I know you're on all the socials and look, if you haven't followed Cody, go for it. He's always got some great nuggets out there. So in terms of finding me, I'm not, I'm not accepting new financial planning clients. So it makes it really easy not to have, you know, sell anything here. I do have an educational platform 
for DIY investors. So, you know, non-advisors, for example, it's a measure, it's called measuretwicemoney.com. I'm actually in the process of creating a comprehensive video course. You know, Dr. J, you asked me earlier, does everybody need a financial planner? I'm actually creating a course to teach non-advisors how to create your own financial plan as a family, whether or not you hire an advisor. Just one of those things, like I'm kind of mentoring you to, to you know, take it on yourself. So measuretwicemoney.com is where you get tons of free education. You know, there's no, no bait and switch. It's just, here's everything I know about this topic. Go for it. Learn as much as you can. Yeah. Awesome. And thanks for having me on, Cody. You know, I think you and I could probably do four more episodes on the unknown unknowns because, because that's literally our business. <laughs> like, you know, like, <laughs> look, this was skipped. What is that? And I don't, you know, anyone that's listening, I don't want you to think about it. Like, you know, we're judging people for not knowing that stuff. It's just the stuff that gets overlooked. And it's because like, it's the pieces that fall through the holes. You know, like you got a good plan, you got a good structure, and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot I should do a will. <laughs> like, you know, you just, you know, it's in the book somewhere that I need to do this, but yeah, there. What you're also seeing is Cody and I are, you know, agree on much of the things. You know, we use slightly different terminology. That's because we're both serving people that are trying to learn how to do this, which is awesome. And I think that's what I like about the DIYers. So they're trying to learn. You just also have to know when to call for help. Like, and that, and there's no right perfect answer on that, but it's like, you want to call for help before you're in trouble <laughs> versus like too late. So thanks for coming on, Cody. And uh, it's been great. Absolutely. I'll be back anytime. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a rating or review. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Follow Child Free Wealth on social media or email us at podcast at childfreewealth.com. If you're interested in working together, book a free consultation call by visiting our website, childfreewealth.com. We'll see you next week.